But I mean, my parents were mercifully free of the problem of religion. You know, they brought me up in this kind of a religious atmosphere, which is their greatest gift to me, I think. And that's why you've gotten um, in so much trouble with every religious group. You know, I mean, I had to, you know I, there was, you, yeah, you noticed that. Um, <laughs> um, but no, there were, like many, many Indian Muslims, um, they saw that phrase, Indian Muslim, as a description of a community, not of a theology. Um, and they certainly didn't wish to live in a state dominated by a religious belief. They, they, that's to say, they saw themselves as Indians first, and Muslims, you know, way down the line. Um, and, and after all, they weren't by any means alone. I mean, in fact, even today, there are many more Muslims living in India than live in Pakistan. So it was a decision made by many people, but it split families. You know, I mean, in my family, for instance, you know, half my family went to Pakistan, the other half stayed in India. It sometimes it broke marriages. You know, one, one member of the marriage wished to go, and the other one wished to stay. So it was a, a terrible rupture. And then, of course, it was hugely exacerbated by the terrible massacres that took place at that time. And you said uh, once that of the three countries that you grew up in, India, Pakistan, and, in, and England, Pakistan was the one you felt most like an outsider. Yeah, Pakistan sucks. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> well, at least yeah, you're being diplomatic, yeah. thank God. Yeah, 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 <laughs> but you be more straightforward. I don't think yeah. I got that one. <laughs> no, no, I know, you know, I know it's one of America's current two allies of the world, but <laughs> <laughs> Saudi Arabia and Pakistan. <laughs> We're on a roll now. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, you know, it sucks. Um, and especially if you're used to India, which is a rich, complicated, open society full of colors and smells and excess and rich, a kind of real richness of life experience. You know, and you, and you go, you cross the frontier into Pakistan, which used to be the same place, you know, 56 years ago, used to be the same place. Now you feel a kind of in a cultural sense, you feel a kind of airlessness. You know, that there's no air to breathe. People aren't allowed to say what they think. They aren't allowed to do what they like. Women and men are segregated. Um, there's a gigantic uh, drug culture because it's one of the world's major produ producers of opium and heroin. There's an exploding AIDS problem, which is, which is not looked at because, of course, Muslims don't get AIDS. Um, there's, <laughs> Uh, there's, a, there's, there's a highly gangsterized urban society, there's political corruption um, on both the civilian and the military side, there's economic corruption so great that 75% of the economy is now believed to be the black economy rather than the overt white economy. Um, there is enormous regional dislike, the Sindhis don't like the Punjabis, nobody likes the Balochis, everybody, <laughs> everybody hates the northwest frontier where they're fundamentalist and pro-Taliban. It sucks. Mm. <laughs> but there you are, you go to England, uh, V.S. Naipaul goes to England, he falls in love with English culture, you fall in love with American culture. You, uh, the Wizard of Oz, you've said, is one of the, the key works in your yeah. life. Well, and American rock and roll seems to be important to you too. Yes, this is all true. This is all true. I'm essentially a very low-grade individual. But <laughs> um. well, what happened to Dickens and all of those? <laughs> <laughs> what happened no, no, to well, Jane that, Austen? What happened no, no, to... No, they're there. Oh, they're okay. there, you know. They're there. I, don't, I do not diss Jane Austen or Charles Dickens. Oh, and I have to tell you, so though, one of, the, one of the proudest moments of my life is I wrote a, a piece about The Wizard of Oz, uh, which originally appeared in, in The New Yorker, and I got a fan letter from a munchkin. <laughs> um, and, uh, I mean, actually, from, two, from Mr. and Mrs. Uh, munchkin, they've both been in the movie. Um, they were now very elderly, obviously. They were living, living in a J.C. Penney retirement home in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Um, and um, the lady, the, uh, the, he was, the man was called Manfred Raber and his wife. That She had been an extra. She'd just been in the big Ding Dong, The Witch is Dead sequence. But he, but, but he had been a, an important, you'll remember him, featured player. He played the Munchkin Coroner. If you remember, he had that hat like that, um, and the scroll, you know, and he, he says, you know, she's not only really dead, she's really most sincerely dead, you know, etc. <laughs> yeah. you know. Let the news at once be spread, the wicked old witch at last is dead. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> um, anyway, him, right? So he writes me a letter saying he liked my, my piece. 
and as a gift he inclu includes in the letter a color Xerox of his big scene. So there he is in his hat and his scroll and as you remember he's got this scroll and on it in big gothic letters it says certificate of death, right? And underneath he's filled in my name. <laughs> so, you know, so I now have a Munchkin death certificate. <laughs> Munchkin patois. <laughs> and, and there's a, there's a, for a minute I think, how funny is this? You know? <laughs> and, and then I think, no, you know, he's this elderly guy in Fort Lauderdale, and, and you know, not much has happened in his life since The Wizard of Oz, because he's been working at J.C. Penney. And, and he sits in this retirement home, and by his bedside, he's got this big stack of color Xeroxes of his big seat, and he's firing off letters to everybody in the world and filling in their names, you know? So anyway, I, I framed it. It's one of my proudest possessions.